Welcome to the Kintsugi Hope podcast. It's great to have you with us. We are joined by some amazing speakers and experts who have experienced, like all of us, life's ups and downs. If you want to find out more about Kintsugi Hope, then please do head to the website kintsugihope.com. And welcome back to the Kintsugi Hope podcast. Um, and this series is called The Truth About. And today we are joined with Lauren Windle, who is an author, a speaker, um, an addiction specialist, um, and generally just pretty great. Um, and we're delighted to have her here as um, we talk about the truth about addiction and mm. specifically how we can be safe and supportive spaces. What does being a safe and supportive space for somebody in recovery or somebody in active addiction look like? Um, and hopefully we're going to, um, yeah, explore that over, over this next little while together. So Lauren, um, thank you so much for being with us. I wonder if you could just uh, kick us off by telling us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, of course. Um, well, I feel like that introduction has covered some of the key points. So I'm an author, a journalist, and I, I do some presenting and public speaking. And that tends to focus around quite broadly, faith, love, and I'd say my first sort of passion, which is addiction and recovery. And that is because I am actually nine years clean and sober from drug addiction and alcohol addiction, which is um, honestly a miracle. Um, and then also I've got a degree in neuroscience and a master's in addiction studies. So as well as having my personal experience, um, I thought it'd be a good idea to get back into sort of education and make sure that I really understood the science and the research around addiction um, and on top of that in the churches I have run um, addiction programs for a few years now um, so I've run a, a recovery course basically that is a it's a 12-step model but it includes sort of the bible and jesus where um, a lot of the programs that use a 12-step model um, would just say a sort of general higher power or a god of your understanding so yeah that's sort of in a nutshell <laughs> but not it's so not a lot really not a lot no oh I, I'm lazy that's yeah. that's what people always say <laughs> yeah that does that does sound lazy <laughs> and um I was kind of fascinated because I was I was reading your website and kind of um I watched your TED talk which um, I'll pop in the show notes actually because it's a really great watch um I think not just about addiction, which obviously is about addiction. It's called Lessons mm -hmm. of Drug Addict Can Teach You, um, but about about how we do community, actually. Yeah. Um, and you quoted, um, I think it's Johan Hari in that, and it, who talks about the opposite of addiction is is connection, not recovery. Um, and mm -hmm. I really love that. And I wonder if you could, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about your story and kind of how that's. Mm the role of, of connection in, in recovery. Yeah. yeah, massively. And actually when I did go back and started studying it, one thing that really struck me was um, there's like a really famous research paper around addiction um, that was really thorough and it looked at all of the different risk and protective factors for a young person going into addiction. Um, and one of the protective factors was going to church so it it did, you know, and and what that means for a young person isn't necessarily that they have that individual personal relationship with Jesus and their Bible reading every day and all of that kind of stuff. But it does mean that they have a stable framework because not everyone's household has has that level of stability and the things that can pose risks are things like a lot of drinking or, or some drug use at home or having a sort of what they'd call a delinquent peer group and friends who are using drugs and and who are drinking to excess and then you know dropping out of school is a risk factor and and being in a in a sort of deprived and and sort of decrepit neighborhood where people aren't really investing in those things and the infrastructure and it, you know it seems silly to think that just putting some money behind putting in a playground or something you know would would make a difference it makes such a difference people feel cared for people feel like not left behind people feel that they have somewhere which is their own that they can gather mm. in a sort of healthy and safe way because people will gather you know and it's just whether or not they have a good and healthy framework for doing it 
And actually, my story, if you look at like addiction stories, um, there are some people and you hear how they got into addiction and you're like, OK, I, I get it, you know, like wow I if if those those were the cards I've been dealt like I would have been looking around for something else too and I'm 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 so sorry that that's where you ended up but like it's not you know it's not a huge leap to me to see why that was the path you took but I'm I'm not quite like that which almost means like no excuses you know I had um two parents who loved me my mum's Christian she took us to church until I was about 13 I have to say I I didn't love church I didn't feel particularly embraced by the community um I felt quite judged in a church environment um Mm. and always felt like I wasn't quite good enough for these very holy ideals and and there was a huge emphasis when I was a teenager on not drinking not taking drugs and not having sex and that was kind of if you ticked those three boxes yeah you were you were the the good kind of Christian teenager you know and there was not really any chat about gossiping or pride or any of the millions of other character defects that people so often have that actually really do need addressing as well. So I stopped going to church um, and it was around that time uh, when I was 13 that I was introduced to alcohol um, by like my friends. That's when friends started getting it from older siblings or taking it from their house or and there are a couple of shops around us that would just sell it to you anyway. They didn't really care, you know. So um, we started drinking and teenagers in South London, where I was from, and actually I think probably teenagers from virtually anywhere, you know, yeah. like just drank and and sometimes they were sick and sometimes, you know, and that, and that was normal. So even though I was drinking in quite an unhealthy way, everyone was drinking in an unhealthy way. So it didn't, you know, it didn't really seem to sort of stand out. But I had always felt this social anxiety. I'd always looked at a group of people and felt like I was on the outside or that I wasn't welcome. Um, And you can really reinforce that view in your mind when you're looking for it. You can find reasons to be like, oh, well, you know, oh, well, they went straight over to hug that person, not me, or oh, they could have called me, or why wasn't I invited to that, rather than looking for reasons why you're valued and cared for and loved. And mm-hmm. actually, it meant that when I turned up to a social thing, I just felt really anxious and drinking just, it didn't make that go away, but it meant that I didn't have to think about it. Um, so I carried on drinking and and drank more and more. And university is just the most beautiful mask for alcoholism that I've ever seen. You know, all socialising is like around drinking, cheap drinking, drinking before you go out to drink cheaply, you know, which places serve the cheapest stuff. And there's like actual frameworks and systems in place to make sure you get to go out and drink quite a lot. You know, Freshers Week is is like basically your intro drinking week you know before you actually have to do I skipped that to bible college Um, ah bible college was was a slightly different scene um yes than than an actual university um but it does like I remember coming home actually from bible college and being like oh that's that's the life actually and it is so embedded in the culture of university um, and actually yeah. you know it was embedded in our culture in the fact that we went to the pub a lot um, yeah. Yeah. and you know most of us did drink we weren't we weren't dry but it was yeah, yeah it does it's less extreme definitely and it, but it's interesting I think we were talking about that al- alcohol being such a central part of of the culture mm. of a place mm. um, yeah and therefore I guess exposing vulnerabilities. Um, yeah, yeah. I t- yeah, no, I totally agree. And actually, um, something which I'm thinking on and reflecting on more, and, and quite a few churches have called me into almost like in a consulting capac- capacity, is that all of our institutions seem to revolve in some way around building connection via alcohol. And and there are churches who subconsciously not not they haven't made a conscious decision that they're going to do that but have slipped into that being a really big part of their framework Mm. um and I think that that can be really isolating so I'm really you know encouraging people who are involved in Christian spaces and churches and things like that to to be mindful more mindful of people who don't want to drink who don't want to feel 
that they are on the outside of of the culture of the community if they're not drinking um and and i think that there is a balance i don't think everywhere needs to never serve alcohol but i think that it needs to be well thought through from the perspective of someone who struggles with alcohol which kind sometimes it's it's not you know yeah mm. I don't know about you, but I've seen a bit of a sea change probably in the last sort of five, five years of of mm. the people, the amount of people choosing not to drink alcohol because they just don't want to drink alcohol and that being a bit more OK. And, yeah. and the growth, I guess, from a commercial point of view of like non-alcoholic drinks that don't just taste like sugar. Yeah. Mm. oh yes well, but look pretty so you can still you know <laughs> look like a grown-up drink you do yeah. the drinks and, and the stuff but they just don't have alcohol in them and so you kind of get the the best of both worlds and I think that yeah. I think that is really positive because not everyone um can drink for reasons of addictions for medications and and not everyone mm. wants to drink and it is that yeah. it's making that okay isn't it yeah someone said the other day that alcohol is the only drug that you have to explain why you're not taking it yes. whereas any other drug you'd have to explain why you are um and and I do think that if we discovered alcohol afresh today it would be a class a drug you know the harms that can come with it are are greater than some illicit drugs um so it's just that it's it's so inbuilt into into our culture and everything that we do um that it's that it's kind of this sort of not only acceptable but kind of expected norm yeah. um for us but yeah no I totally agree and when I first got sober nine years ago and I guess we'll loop back and I'll tell you how I got there because it's a it's a happy yeah. ending <laughs> um, but yeah when I first got sober nine years ago it was like I remember drinking loads of orange juice and being like, well, I can't sit here all night drinking orange juice. You get sugar and dehydrated and you're like, oh, you know, and and at first I was like tr still trying to match people drink for drink. I was like, everyone's doing rounds and I would, yes, I'll have an orange juice. And actually you just can't, you just can't keep up like that. And I learned very quickly that that was not the way <laughs> to do it. And I started drinking just tonic water because it, felt like a happy compromise there's some sugar in it but it's not like a it's not like a diet coke or something it doesn't feel very sweet and childish um but even that's like you know it's a it's a good alternative but these days there's just everything yeah. you know there's absolutely any drink you want has a non-alcoholic uh, equivalent and people are really invested in making sure as you say that there are adult non-alcoholic drinks available and I'm really grateful for that it means I can still have a cocktail although those drinks are still really expensive <laughs> no, there's no alcohol yeah. <laughs> they made it pretty so they charged it for you exactly yeah so it's it's a balance sometimes I'm just like I'll just stick with the tonic water I don't want to spend eight pounds on a drink <laughs> yeah. so yeah so, so yeah so I guess looping back you are in recovery, mm. in recovery for, for nine years what mm. what was that journey like um yeah broadest question ever yeah well I think um so from university before things got better they got worse and that's for sure and I um I didn't I, I did I tried drugs here and there like smoking a bit of cannabis or or whatever but actually dr drugs weren't a huge part of my story until I was about 22 and I'd broken up from a boyfriend and there was a lot of sort of codependency and it was a really unhealthy relationship and he he broke up with me and I was absolutely devastated and then I left university and we um I got a job in hospitality and it's very much like work hard, play hard in that industry. And actually like a lot of industries, there's a real drinking culture. Um, and people started offering me cocaine. <clears throat> Sorry. And yeah. And the, the cocaine didn't feel like such a stupid idea. I wasn't involved in church or had any particular relationship with God at the time. I hadn't gone back to church since I'd left at 13. Um, I, I was searching for something and I didn't really know what it was. And I still had all of those same anxieties. And this time, you know, my sort of dream, my, the life I wanted ahead of me was was gone um, because I wanted to be someone's wife and, you know, have their kids and get a dog and all of that stuff. And then and then we broke up. So I was like, well, I might as well go for this. And I did. And. And. Then things started to really spiral. I think it's easy 
to tell yourself you don't have a problem with drinking because you can always find someone who drinks more than you. You can always be like, oh, John, you know, mm. oh, you should see the way John puts it away. I, I drink way less than that. You know, you can, and also drinking's kind of, yeah, like we said, it's acceptable, socially acceptable. Whereas when you're taking drugs, you can't really hide from yourself that there's a problem you know like there's only so far you can kid yourself that that's normal because it's you know it's quite clear that people taking drugs four times a week is not the norm it's not socially acceptable in the same way that drinking four times a week is um so I definitely knew then that okay this is a new level of of choices of behavior um I just I just I think I'd be hard pushed to say I cared I think I just thought like, this is what I want to do. I'm, you know, I'm young, I'm going to party. How bad can it be? But actually things really did spiral quite quickly. Um, and over the next few years, I I um, had some physical symptoms. I got like floaters in front of my eyes and numbness in my fingers and toes and terrible nosebleeds. And I would have this memory loss and it was it was really awful but more so than that was the desperation and the feeling of being alone and and being out with people and then having them call it a night and me thinking no I've got to keep going I can't go home now and then just going home and sitting up on my own taking drugs drinking smoking and the horrible thing about cocaine right is that it's like that depiction of hell where everyone's got an itch, but no one can scratch it. That literally nothing is enough. You can't get enough cocaine. You can't drink enough. You can't talk enough. You can't smoke enough. You can't stay up late enough. There's, you just want to keep going. And, and you're terrified of the moment when you're forced to stop because something runs out, time or drugs or drink or something. And you have to stop and face the mess that you've made of that night and go to bed and have your heart race and not be able to fall asleep and tell yourself, promise yourself, you will never do that again, knowing full well that the next night you'll probably just do it again. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's really dark. And I think a lot of people will hear this story because I tell it and I tell it on, you know, podcasts like this and and on um stages and they'll think like oh yeah I did a bit of cocaine you know and now she's free and that's lovely and what a beautiful story there's nothing beautiful about addiction it is it is dark and desperate and grimy and shameful and it takes you to the most horrific places and it deeply affects your relationship with yourself because you see yourself making decisions that damage you mm but you know you're not gonna stop making that decision and you just start, the value that you place on yourself is just chipping away as you accept an increasingly lower standard of, of living and of care and, and all of those things. So it's really tough, really tough lifestyle to be in. And that, I think, a combination of, of that just completely spiraling and a few choice words and encouragements from friends and family around me is probably the path that I believe God put in place to get me, to get me into recovery. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you. There's something, I think, there's something so powerful, I think, about tell hearing the story, mm -hmm. um, both with the knowledge that actually you're okay and that the ending's good, um, yeah. <laughs> but also of, of not shying away from the horror of it mm. um, because I think that in order to raise awareness of, of, of anything and um, whether it's addiction or, or mental illness um, we can't shy away from the horror of the pain mm. of the problem and um, mm. we can't kind of gloss it's that um, holy Saturday story isn't it it's like we can't gloss over the hell to yeah. get to Easter Sunday um, yeah. because actually God was with you, even though you didn't know it in that space, mm. even though it didn't look like it. Mm. Um, and God is is with us in the hellish bits um, yeah. as much as he is with, in the happy bits. We just don't feel it. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's us, not, not him, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That, yeah, that's, that's, that's actually such a good point. The difference is us, not him, because he doesn't change. And there's that thing, isn't it? When, when you feel yourself 
distant from God, ask yourself who moved. And I really like that because <laughs> it's it's so direct, like God's not pushing you away, you know, um, it was. Yeah. So it was very definitely me pushing God away. And I and there were moments, you know, like I remember once being really high and sitting on my sofa and thinking, oh, you know, God will give me a sign or something. And it was like 4.30 a.m. And I was just flicking through the TV, like on Freeview and going up to like the really high channels where there was like Christian radios. Yeah, yeah exactly like just just like maybe there's maybe someone's gonna say something to me that's gonna change my life and you know that kind of stuff but I was I was just so erratic and frantic and you know and and I was just looking for anything really that I could cling on to um but it was yeah I, I so my sister I told my sister what I was doing and she took me to a church she she was amazing she took me to church and she moved me in with her and she encouraged me to leave my job because it was such a negative influence. And she, um, yeah, and in the ch in church they said, does anyone want prayer? And she was gutted because I, I, she really wanted me to stand up and ask for prayer, but that felt so daunting. You know, it's, it's quite a lot for someone who hasn't been to church for years and years and years, who knows that they're stuck in this horrific place to walk to the front of a really busy church or stand up or raise their hand to ask for prayer it just it, it didn't feel right to me yeah and and afterwards she said like okay so what do you think do you want to keep going to church and I was like yeah um no though like I think they're really nice people but I just can't I just can't imagine like this being me I think it's your thing I don't like need it to be mine, you know? And she was gutted and she was praying and she was like, God, you say that if people reach out, you reach back. Like, why aren't you coming for her? What What's going on? You know, why, why is this happening? And it was, um, and I, it was all down to God's timing. And I, I needed that, I needed that seed to be planted. And then um, a little while later, some of my friends encouraged me to go to a support group meeting because they could see that I was really spiraling as well. And I went in and, and I just, I found a group of people who are so kind. And I think that when people are sharing, sharing a story that's sim similar or in some ways very much the same as yours, it feels like a magic trick because you feel so alone. You can't imagine anyone else has ever felt the level of agony that you feel in that in that in those dark dark moments but hearing somebody else talk you know and I think the same goes for any any struggle with mental health right hearing someone else say like yeah I know like yeah me too actually it's it's just it's a it releases a pressure valve um that is that is really special and I was it was a third day after that and someone said to me about um about my higher power um, and I really felt like I should turn up at a church just to check. Basically, you know, what people in recovery do is, you know, if they a lot of people in recovery have got real resentment towards the church because of some sort of they, they didn't feel they were well treated or they definitely weren't well treated or there was some level of abuse or something <clears> like <throat> that. Um, so but people who often people will explore the idea of Christianity or their childhood faith. And if that doesn't work, they just become a yoga instructor. And we've got like a million yoga instructors in recovery. And that probably was my mindset. Like, right, I'll do the God thing. And if that doesn't work, it'll be the yoga, you know? <laughs> and I, I went off to a church and it was just so the right place for me to be. And this time when they said, do you want prayer? I went to the front and said, yeah, I, I actually would like prayer. I'm, I'm five days ago, I walked into a recovery meeting for, for drugs and alcohol and I'm really trying not to drink and I haven't drunk or taken drugs since then. Can you help me? And they were incredible. And they, and they gathered a couple around and prayed for me and invited me to this women's Bible study. And I remember, so at the time I had agreed that I would do 90 meetings in 90 days, which is a lot. But the rationale behind it is if you can invest that much time in drinking and taking drugs, you can invest that much time in your recovery. And that would give you a really solid foundation and also something to do on days when you would have usually been drinking. Yeah. So I was at this church and I knew that one hour or 45 minutes after the church service finished, I had to be somewhere 
for this um, recovery meeting. And I didn't know where, I was like such a mess. I didn't like Google Maps it and plan it. I just knew, leave the church service, Google it and get there. And I put the address into like Google Maps as I was on the sort of front step of the church. And the little like dotty thing just went boom where I was. And I was like, okay, that's broken because that's where I am, not where I'm going. So I put the address in a second time and I realized that the recovery meeting I wanted was in the same building as the church. And that meant that I had an extra 45 minutes to go up, grab a cup of tea, have a biscuit because they had a little sort of socializing thing afterwards and actually chat to a few people and and start to warm up to the idea of that being my church. And that was so special. And it's just, you know, things like that can feel really small. They are really small, you know, like, oh, and then it turned out the meeting was there. And you can just be like, well, that's that's just a really nice coincidence. I really believe that God plants those little things for us just to be like, hey, I've got you. I'm going to make this. I, everything's been really hard. I'm going to make this one thing really easy, you know, just for you. And that's a little treat for you, you know, and I and that was really special. And there are a few little things like that punctuated through my journey that just just said to me, like, God's got me, you know. I think it's Anne Lamott, the writer, who says everything's grace. Everything's grace. Mm. Um, yeah and yeah it is it's those the smallest things that do they do make the biggest difference it is that yeah. and community is one of those things that's both massive and small at the same time it's made yeah. up of a million yeah. pieces isn't it mm-hmm. um of people putting themselves out people making tea people yeah. saying are you really okay though or mm. you know you want to grab a coffee in the week um that that makes community really matter um Mm. and and something worth investing in Mm. and I wonder I guess as we as we kind of come in into land what what can churches do what can we do um to support somebody in recovery um or perhaps in in inactive addiction in a Mm. way that is not patronizing and in a way that actually helps because I think as is with the case with mental illness we often have lots of ideas of how we could help but knowing what will actually help is always the best bet (laughs) yeah so there are three parts three things um that I think churches would really benefit from from looking at and asking themselves the first is what is their environment like do they serve alcohol in the church building do they do it after the service Um, Is it made clear to people before they turn up that someone might offer them a glass of wine, you know, because uh, the vast majority of people in recovery would assume that they're walking into a sort of alcohol free safe space in a church. And that's not always the case. Sometimes after the service, there'll be wine at the back or someone walking around with trays of wine even, you know, and actually um, how helpful is that? Um, Is there an alternative way to connect than going to the pub after your church? You know, do you do sort of big events for young people that are actually really boozy? And, you know, I've been to a church event where with your ticket, you get a free drink, but there was no alcohol free alternative. Mm. And you're like, OK, well, I'll just pay for my tonic water then. You know, and it's just and it, they're not mean. They just they just haven't sort of taken the time to think about it from a different perspective. Mm. So what the culture is like in terms of of drinking when you go away to, to your church weekend away or festival or whatever are there sufficient opportunities for connection that don't involve alcohol? And if you do want to include alcohol in some of your social events, really think through, is it necessary for this one? Is it necessary for this one? You know, because it doesn't have to be all of them, I would say. And if you are going to serve alcohol, make it painfully clear Mm. on your marketing material, on the invite, on the flyer, on the PowerPoint slide that goes up, you know, make it really clear that both alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks will be available so that someone can go, okay, I don't feel like I can be in a space where alcohol is being served today, so I'm not going to come. And they and they know that without being caught off guard beforehand. So that's the first one. The second one, I'd say, make sure that your leadership understand what addiction looks like mm-hmm. and have the opportunity to challenge addictive behaviours in themselves. Because whilst not everyone and thankfully very few people will have my story of drinking and taking drugs 
everyone is susceptible to those compulsive behaviors, to making a decision in that moment that they know they don't want to, that won't serve them long term, but it's what they want in the short term. You know, how many times have you said, I'm just going to eat one bit of cake and then gone back for another? Like we all we can all relate to that, you know, even if it's not a daily um, occurrence for most people. So just asking ourselves on that sort of scale of zero, where like Jesus is exactly on the throne and everything's right to 100, where you, it's a full blown addict. So on that whole scale of um, of what I would say idolatry, yeah. if you ask yourself, you know, money, food, sex, alcohol, drugs, you know, phone, computer games, whatever those sort of things are and you ask yourself where you're at with them just checking in and making sure that you're towards the bottom end you know and that if you see it creeping up that you challenge it in yourself because I think we do have addiction in our in our church leadership mm -hmm. and if we're going to better facilitate things for our congregations it would be it would be really important for those in leadership to recognize that and to give it and to give it some space and time to yeah. pull things back down to the other end of the scale. Um, so that's the second thing. And the final thing I would say is um, knowing where you can sign post people, you know, because it's all very well being able to identify addiction in yourself or in in someone in the congregation and understanding what it looks like, but then what are you gonna do? You know, you've just got a problem. <laughs> so um, there are plenty of churches that actually run courses. You know, there's steps course, there's celebrate recovery, there's the recovery course as well um, that run around the country. Um, particularly if you're up north, celebrate recovery is in most of the major cities and down south, I'd say recovery course is, is dotted around quite well as well. Um, it's definitely worth looking into those kinds of programs. And now, you know, the silver lining of the pandemic is a lot of that's available online now as well. If you really can't get to somewhere in person, yeah. then you can do those courses online and just knowing where they are, knowing where people will be who can give that attention and recognition and understanding because you can be very understanding. But if you haven't experienced it yourself, there's a there's a sort of limit to the amount of recognition that you can give that person. Um, so yeah, e I mean, amazing if churches want to start up a program like that and they should definitely reach out to the charities that run run those programs because they franchise them out and will provide you with all of the material and the training. Um, but but if that's not you resources and time-wise, which it wouldn't be for a lot of people, then just knowing you know your local charities, your local churches that do have a program like that, where those anonymous fellowship meetings are, AA, NA, GA for gambling, OA for overeating, you know, there's there's lots of different A's around, you yeah. know, for different people with different needs. Um, and encouraging people to to check those out, as well as obviously praying for people and 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 bringing them into that church family and church community. Amazing. Thank you so much, Lauren. And thank you for your thank you for your honesty, but also your wisdom. I, I really appreciate oh. you kind of bringing bringing both parts. Um Thank yeah. you for having me. Um, and if you would like to know more, we will put um, uh, Lauren's website um, and a link to Lauren's book, which is called Notes on Love, which is about um, singleness in the church, which maybe we'll do another episode mm -hmm. on another time. Um, <laughs> so we'll pop all that in the show notes for you. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us at the Kintsugi Hope podcast. It's been great to have you with us. If you want to find out more about this amazing charity that creates safe and supportive spaces for those that are experiencing social isolation or poor mental health, then do check out the website kintsugihope.com. We'll see you on the next episode.